Hi, I'm Shelby and I love Shakespeare. If you haven't seen one of my tutorials before, I take a monologue from Shakespeare and break it down for you line by line so you know exactly what every single word means and also what acting clues are inherent to the text that you can use on your performance or your audition. This tutorial is extremely special because not only am I going to make sure that you understand what this character is saying, I'm also going to splice in some clips from a live coaching I did of this speech. <laughs> yeah. My very special friend, Natalie Crosby, is the owner of a company that I work with called Your Party Princess. The speech we're going to be tackling today is from A Midsummer Night's Dream that begins over hill, over dale, done by a character simply called Fairy. I recorded a monologue performance of that very fairy speech in last week's video. However, for the cosplay video coming next week, I asked Natalie, who's never done Shakespeare before, to do the speech in the cosplay as one of her very famous Disney princesses. And I'm not going to tell you whom she is portraying in the cosplay. You'll just have to find out next week. And this speech is super fun and super quick and very magical and a little sassy. So let's dive right into this very special hybrid with myself and Natalie. And I know zero about Shakespeare. The only thing I know about Shakespeare is what I've learned through Shelby's channel. If there's anyone out there that doesn't know anything about Shakespeare, you're in good company. Yes, tutorial, Natalie. You are in very good company and a lot of people have no idea about Shakespeare, but that's why you have me. So without any further ado, here is the fairy speech from A Midsummer Night's Dream that begins over hill, over dale. <laughs> For my text work, I like to break it down into three sections. They are up to this point, vocab and paraphrase, and the three chunks. So first let's get you up to this point. Usually when I talk about up to this point, I am trying to describe the moment before and where they're coming from and how that informs what your character is speaking in this monologue. However, in regards to the fairy, there's no up to this point. This speech is in act two, scene one. It is the very first time that we've seen not only this character of fairy, but also it's the first time we're seeing the enchanted forest that A Midsummer Night's Dream is so famous for. So instead of a true up to this point, I'm gonna give you a little bit of general context of this fairy's life and job and more about what happens after than before, because after is what we as the audience can see. In this enchanted forest, there's a king and a queen. The king's name is Oberon, and he has one minion named Puck, who's kind of a fairy, kind of a sprite, kind of a goblin. When I directed A Midsummer Night's Dream, this is what my Puck looks like. Very mischievous, very athletic, but not necessarily elegant. And then we have the queen of the fairies named Titania, but she doesn't have just one sidekick or minion. She has a whole following of beautiful elves and fairies. Now there's quite a bit of contention between the king and the queen, mostly out of competition. And in this play in particular about a little baby boy that Titania has taken into her court and Oberon once, basically with the argument of, you have all of these fairies, like I only have Puck, give this little boy to me. And Oberon gets jealous, makes her fall in love with the donkey. It's a great play. But what we're concerned with is the fairy. So what's important for us to know in regards to this exact speech is that the fairy serves the fairy queen and is very proud of that. And right before this speech, Puck says the line, how now spirit, whither wander you? Which is his version of saying, hey you, where are you going? But obviously in beautiful old English. So let's move on to vocab and paraphrase. The name of this character, Fairy, only happens this one time. There are four named fairies in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Mustard Seed, Peas Blossom, Cobweb, and Moth. Isn't that cute? <laughs> and when I directed this production, I added two fairies and named them Toadstool and Dewdrop. And you'll see where I got the name for that as we go through this speech. Let's start with the very first line, over hill, over dale. Now, What's a hill? A hill, right? <laughs> Nothing fancy, just a green hill. Dale is another word for vale or valley. So already we have over hill, which is high, and then over dale. So we have this action of up, down, which can be reflected in performance in your voice or your physicality or both. Next line, thorough bush, thorough briar. Before we talk about the images that pertain to the magical forest, let's talk about this word thorough. Now thorough means through. So sometimes I've seen people change the script to say through bush, through briar, 
And it kills my soul for this reason. Without honoring Shakespeare's original text and meter, we lose a huge amount of information and essential action. Let me explain. Let's just take these first four lines and listen to the meter. Over hill, over dale, throw a bush, throw a briar, over park, over pale, throw a flood, throw a fire. Does it sound like anything? I'll do it one more time without the words. A horse's gallop. That's what it sounds like. That scansion type is called an anapest. Normally, Shakespeare is written in something called iambic pentameter, which means 10 syllables long of five feet of an unstressed and stressed syllable. All that to say, it goes de dum, de dum, de dum, de dum, de dum. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? But this speech, over hill, over dale, that's only six syllables. And if you did it within that regular meter of iambic pentameter, over hill, over dale, doesn't sound right. How we would say it is over hill, over dale. So it's unstressed, unstressed, stressed. So in this anapest type of scansion, we hear a gallop, which gives the actor who's performing fairy the clue and the permission to be so active and dynamic and move all around the stage. So then when people truncate thorough to through, it loses the gallop. That's why we keep this. And that's why Shakespeare wrote it this way. He knew how to write the word through. Assume that he's a genius and he knows what he's doing. And don't worry about ever changing or dumbing down Shakespeare. Shakespeare was an actor and he wrote this for actors to be able to understand and thrive within his words. So don't change it to through ever. And now you know what? Back to our images. Thorough bush, thorough briar. For this piece, I'm going to pop it over to Natalie because I loved her discovery on this contrast. So let's see what her best guess is of what this line could mean. So what's a bush? A bush. Great. And then what's a briar? You know, I don't know what a briar is, but I immediately thought of briar rose. So is it like a flower valley or a flower bush? I don't know. That's my guess. Exactly. There's some kind of percussiveness within those bees that would be necessary athletically to get through things that are kind of tangled up like this. I can do really smooth things and I can do really hard things. And you can use that B to kind of prove it. That makes so much sense, but I never would have thought about that. Because it's like, it's percussive, the bush briar. Over park, over pale. I love what Natalie said about this. What's a park? I mean, I had thought of like a playground, but I don't know if that was, but if they had that in that time, I don't know. Probably not like a, a slide or a, you know, a tire swing, but yeah. You know, when we think of, oh, I go to the park, it's wide open. It's an expanse. And then pale, any idea? I don't know. I'm not sure what pale means. I mean, I thought of like a pail, like a bucket. For pale, I had to look it up too. A pail is something that's enclosed or fenced in and cattle, cows are put into a pail. So the contrast that we have in images is park, expansive, wide open and pale, more closed in, maybe harder to get through or to fit into. And then we talked about another princess reference for the next line, thorough flood, thorough fire. Obviously a flood is a large body of water and a natural disaster and a fire we know there's lots of different kinds of fires, big and small, but let's see what Natalie and I discovered the fairy means by bringing up these exact images. Fun way to think about Shakespeare textually is what else could it, the word have been? So why didn't Shakespeare say through pond, through lake? You know, it's the same syllable, so it works in the meter. Why do you think he said flood? A flood is like the most intense form of water. We're starting to see, not that the fairy is bragging, but is definitely saying the largest and most cool examples of this is what I do for my job, right? So flood, disastrous, huge, and going through a flood. All these princess metaphors today, like Elsa in the dark sea, right? Bell in the great wide somewhere. Exactly. So just to recap the first four lines of this speech, over hill, over dale, contrast of high, low, thorough bush, thorough briar. So bush, fluffy, leafy, briar, thorny, hard to get through. Over park, 
over pale, the contrast of open and closed, throw flood, throw fire. So a huge body of water and a huge body of fire, all contrasts and all dynamic active images and all six syllables until the next line, I do wander everywhere which is seven syllables. So what would you say are kind of the stress syllables? I do wander everywhere. So I want and where? I do wander everywhere. It's dumdy. I do um. wander everywhere. The other cool thing to think about these being dumdy instead of de dum is that the fairy, like we mentioned earlier, is making their own rules. I don't go how other people normally go. I do this and this and this. So from those six galloping lines, and then we have a seventh, I think it allows a little bit of space and epicness for the fairy to savor her dramatic, impressive moment. I do wonder everywhere. Mm -hmm. I've given you examples of all these places I go. So pretty much I go everywhere. And not only does this fairy go everywhere, but they go very quickly, swifter than the moon sphere. And now instead of this, these images of thorny bushes and briars, we get these spherical images beginning. So swifter than the moon sphere, it's going from this earthly plane to the sky. So not only do I wander everywhere here, I wander there as well and just as quickly as the stars and the planets. Again, this idea of impressing. And I serve the fairy queen. And fairy queen is capitalized. This is a proper noun. It's not just, oh yeah, there's a queen and I serve her. This is the fairy queen. And Titania, the name is at Titan. Very epic, powerful, strong woman. And it said that Shakespeare wrote to Tanya as Queen Elizabeth. So very complimentary of the queen. Go save the queen. The next line explains what this fairy does to serve the queen. To do her orbs upon the green. Let's see what Natalie guessed. In the morning when there's dew on the grass, is it this fairy's job to place each orb upon each blade of grass? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, Natalie got it perfectly right. Doing orbs upon the green, dew, like a morning dew. This fairy is the person who puts dew on every single piece of nature. And I also love this idea of dew as a verb. And so she takes those orbs and she dews the orbs. I dews it. <laughs> you might hear me say it a little differently sometimes where I say dew the orbs. That's something called a liquid you, and it's a voice and diction choice. Anytime you hear someone say duke, tune. It's as if they're putting a Y after a consonant and in front of a U vowel. It makes it sound a little more posh, a little more pleasing to the ear. So I think within the fairy character, who is completely open to interpretation, you can make that decision for yourself as the actor. So now let's get into the description of what else might be in the fairy queen's world with the next line. The cow slips tall, her pensioners be. And as Natalie was memorizing the speech, I was torturous to her because I was like, I'm not going to tell you what a cowslip is because <laughs> I want you to guess on camera because I don't think anybody knows what a cowslip is. I certainly didn't when I first saw this speech. So let's watch her finally discover what a cowslip is. Immediately, my mind went to an actual cow, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Is a cowslip a type of grass? I don't know. I really don't know. So a cowslip, to finally put you out of your misery, you ready Please. for this? A sweet, sweet flower. Okay, so I was kind of on the right track. So a cowslip is a beautiful, tall, yellow flower with these really, really long stalks and has these beautiful bell petals that almost look down. So that's what a cowslip is. A pensioner is a protector, a bodyguard. So her pensioners, meaning the queen's pensioners. So these cowslips protect the queen. Because of how they're shaped, I think of them as almost being lookouts. They look like streetlights to me in a way. So they keep an eye out. And then Natalie had this beautiful idea that maybe the way 
it protects the queen is by serving as an umbrella. So that's another perfectly valid interpretation of this. I love that image. I had never thought about that before, which is why I love coaching because anytime you introduce Shakespeare to someone new, they bring their own personal experiences and it only informs the text and expands it further. The next line talks a little bit more about the cowslips. In their gold coats, spots you see. Gold coat meaning what? The petals, the, the gold petals. Yeah, exactly. And then spots you see. Did you see any spots on those flowers? No. Right? So we're not quite sure what the spots are, but that's why we keep reading. And if you ever run into something like that where you are like, I do not know what this line means, keep going. The context will reveal itself, I promise. Those be rubies, fairy favors. So what's a ruby? A red gem a jewel. Again, we didn't see any spots in that cowslip picture, and we certainly didn't see any ruby spots, right? So if you do a favor for someone, right, you're doing something helpful. But in this context, I think favor is more at a favor that you would get as a gift, like a wedding favor. Fairy favors are little gifts that fairies leave behind as they're doing their jobs. There's still a mystery about spots, but let's keep going to the next line. In those freckles live their savers. Let's look at the picture again. Do you see that a little bit? Oh yeah, like right on the inside, they do look like little freckles. She's giving examples of all these places she goes, and now she's giving an example of how special she does what she does. You wanna see how good I am at it? Look closely. Very special, very elegant gifts that she leaves. Now the next line, Natalie completely intuited, which is why I have people, when they get a new speech, I have them read it out loud three times at least. And then I have them guess what it is. Shakespeare can seem very confusing, but if you allow yourself a little bit of vulnerability to guess what you intuit about the text, I guarantee you, your guesses will be more right than wrong. Again, Shakespeare wrote these words for actors. The next line, I must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. So Natalie was 100% on this next one. So let's look. Is that her saying, I've said my piece, I gotta go do my very important work. Peace out. Bye. <laughs> Each of her dewdrops is valued as valuable as a pearl. It's like every email <laughs> we write is a jewel. And now we're in the home stretch with these final two lines. Farewell, thou lob of spirits. I'll be gone. What does that mean? Well, she's saying goodbye. To who? The lob of spirits, but I thought she was talking to Puck. I think she's calling him a lob of spirits. It doesn't sound very, um, sounds a little insulting. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just lob sounds like blob. I don't know. It just doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> this last line is, our queen and all her elves come here anon. However, on Natalie's printout, it said, the queen and all our elves come here anon. And when we see a discrepancy like that, it doesn't mean that there was a mistake made. It means that there was a choice and an interpretation made of the text. Well, we consider the first really useful compilation of Shakespeare's works. It's called the first folio. There are a lot of different ways that things are spelled or look. When you have all these different editions of the same plays, it's because editors have taken into account the first folio, the quartos, other editions, and made an informed, educated decision on what that word that is in contention should be. So I took a picture of this speech within the first folio and sent it to Natalie to look at. And we had so many discoveries. So let's watch. One thing, I did have you print out that folio picture, right? Yes. Okay. So our queen and all our elves come here anon. I wanted to check the folio because I've heard it two different ways of that way. And then also our queen and all her elves come here anon. Our queen and all her elus, it's E L U E S, come here, here spelled with two E's, anon. How would you pronounce that? Exactly how you pronounce it. But the cool thing about the folio is that when you have words that are spelled differently than we spell them, usually elongated like that, it's a way of Shakespeare as the playwright giving these lines to his actors and immediately for them to know what the important word is. Our elves versus her elves. Do you have a preference? 
Yeah, I prefer her elves because it makes the queen sound more important. I've seen it both ways so many times, but who as the actor have that choice. So now Natalie has a choice and so do you. And I did want to mention because you're like elves has a U and stuff like that. That's not actually showing that it's important. That's showing that old timey archaic printing presses. They just didn't have a V. That is fascinating. Yay. So we've gotten through the whole speech and so has Natalie. I asked her what she might've discovered about the speech, anything new or anything more clarifying and how that's going to help her as she prepares for her cosplay performance. Just in my mind, it all makes sense. Like I can actually picture what I'm saying. So just visually in my mind, it's just completely different. Yeah. And the lob, farewell, the lob of spirits. Like knowing that it's an insult you're throwing at him. Yes, lob is so fun. (laughs) So I'm not going to do a full paraphrase of this speech because it is pretty self-explanatory now that you know the vocab. So let's move on to the next section, which will kind of inherently be a consolidating paraphrase called the three chunks. When I say three chunks, I think about each monologue, especially if you're doing it as an audition, as a mini play with a beginning, middle, end. You coming in are responsible for taking whomever you're doing the speech for on a journey. So you need to make sure that you're extremely clear about how you start the speech, where you go in the middle and how you end it. And what's different about your character by going through this monologue's journey. It's only 16 lines and especially with that gallop energy, it goes very, very quickly. So when I say three chunks, it means we're going to chunk the speech into three sections, taking note of when the transitions happen either in tone or in subject matter. And then we're going to assign one word to each of those chunks in order to encapsulate or simplify the journey of this monologue in just three words. So let's check in with Natalie to see what she thinks her three chunks are. So the first part is is very quick, fast. This is where I'm going. It feels like you're on a ride with a fairy going all up and down side to side going so it's very quick pace and then all of a sudden where it changes is I do wander everywhere um swifter than the moon sphere um and then all through the middle it's kind of her bragging on herself and showing how important she is um until she says okay gotta go (laughs) and so that's why that spot to me seems like the third chunk of where there's a shift. What's your word for the first chunk? The first word that came to my mind was zoom. Mm. And then what about the second chunk? I think of like her duties. The last bit, what's a word that makes sense there? Peace out. So Natalie's three sections make total sense. There's no right or wrong answer. You just wanna make sure as the actor that it makes sense to you and that it's informed. Now the way to make it a little more actionable is making it about the person you're talking to. So (laughs) you are zooming. But what are you trying to do to Puck? Impress him. Mm -hmm. And then the second section is more of the patronizing him or one-upping him. And then I love peace out for the end. You know, I like, (laughs) but you're not piecing out him, right? So you are wetting him. I think to desert him was a good word for it. So now that Natalie has words that are all about Puck, we can incorporate both her first set of words with her second set of active words. You're zooming all around in the first bit to impress him. And you're like, let me tell you how I wander. (laughs) You're portraying status so that you can belittle him. And then the third one, you say peace out so that you can desert him. That's fascinating how those, like coming up with those words, just one sentence to clarify each chunk and it all makes sense. So humans at home, comment below and try and guess what character behind Natalie is going to be the cosplay for the fairy speech. Be any one of these. So do you have any idea who the cosplay character could be? And even though she'll technically be speaking the speech, I also do make a bit of a cameo. So I will see you there too. (laughs) I'm so grateful for Natalie. That was so brave of her. Many times Shakespeare can be very intimidating. And I just, 
honor her courage for saying, I'm going to try something new and I'm going to trust you, Shelby, to teach me what these words mean. I was just so proud of her, especially for all the light bulbs of her going, oh my gosh, it is what I thought. Your only job is to make sure you know what you're saying and imbue this language with your own personality and what makes you magical. If you found value in this video and you feel like you know a little bit more about Shakespeare, click the thumbs up below so that I know. And also make sure to subscribe so that you know the minute Natalie's Cosplay Shakespeare video drops, which is also an amazing collaboration with Daisy Perosi Hickey. This next video is off the charts. You're going to love it. I'll see you back here on Shelby Loves Shakespeare. Anon! That's Shelby. Yeah, that's Shelby. Where's Shelby? Where's Shelby? <laughs>